And so what's different in wraparound? So what, what is different, and you know, we don't have a whole lot of time with, with that family, the Evans family, we can kind of describe all of the ways in which that family received help through this process. It's, we can only be able to do a thumbnail sketch here. But what's different in wraparound is you have an integrated plan designed by a team of people important to the family. And that plan is driven by and owned by the family and you. The plan focuses on the priority needs as identified by the family and the team so that this team comes together to help them prioritize across life domains. What are the two or three things we really need to do first? And you might have a probation officer there and a child welfare case worker, and they've got to kind of work together to figure out what the number one, two, three priorities are, right, as opposed to 30, 35, okay? Now, more beyond that, then, you, you come up with strategies, and you, you're brainstorming really actively strategies that are going to be uniquely fit to succeed for this family. <coughs> and the strategies include supports and interventions across multiple life domains, and they also include support for the adult siblings and family members in this young person's life. Out of home placement is typically dictated by two things. One, has the family been placed out of the home before? And two, uh, are the people who are going to care for them in the community feeling like they're supported uh, to be able to do so in the future? All right. So we need to have strategies that include supports for the family members of this youth and their parents or caregivers. So these are some things that are different in wraparound. Now what we've done over the last six years or so is develop a, a, a more clear practice model for what it means to say you actually have these wraparound facilitators doing this work. Make sure that they've got adequate skills to do what is an incredibly difficult job. Organize the effort of all these people, including some very typically you know, strong-willed, opinionated service providers, probation officers, caseworkers, therapists oftentimes. Uh, they have to be able to engage the family. They've got to be able to monitor this plan over time. So some of the things we've got to do is make sure that their caseloads are, are adequately low and that they're really well trained to do this job. Once they're trained, what they're doing is taking the family or the youth through four phases, um, engagement and team preparation, uh, initial plan development, plan implementation, and then a transition phase. And um, pretty quickly here, here are some examples of things that happen during each of those phases, and that these individuals are increasingly, cons with, with increasing consistent consistency, getting trained to be out there and coached. So in that, in that first phase, we're talking about a uh, care coordinator or wraparound facilitator, and oftentimes a family support peer-to-peer -peer support uh, person meeting with the family to just discuss the process, listen to the family's story. You know, they're really, um, it's, it's pretty interesting when, when folks, sometimes they come from different backgrounds that are more um, kind of rooted in, in, in professional services, trying to train them to just recognize that your first job is just to Open up your ears, empty your mind, and listen. Right? We're going to give you enough time to do that. We're going to give you enough time to actually create this alliance with this family. Um, now, along with that, you also have to immediately assess for safety and crisis planning and make, make plans to deal with those things if necessary. But beyond that, we're really talking about this engagement process, discussing concerns, needs, hopes, dreams, and strengths, being very positively oriented, um, reinforce successes that they have achieved, find small ways to get little victories right away so that that's, um, uh, that self-efficacy can start to get built back up again from the, uh, in the caregiver and the family. Listen to the family's vision for the future. Identify people who care about the family and people that they have found helpful, and reach an agreement about who's going to come to that first team meeting. So a couple of you know, salient points about this first phase. You're really moving, you're, you're creating this alliance. You're, you're moving from emphasizing problems to competence wherever possible. We recognize these are complex families, but wherever possible, you're emphasizing their competence and things that worked for them in the past, things that they have done that have been successful. You know, it's kind of in that narrative therapy kind of reframing kind of uh, condition to some extent. Um, you're moving from the role of being an expert, which um, a lot of these families have seen a lot of, to the role of an accountable ally. And that's where these family peer-to-peer -peer support workers can really come in handy as well. This is someone who's actually lived this with their own kids, who is part of this team. Um, from working on professional turf to working on family turf, from teaching to to learning with, these just a few things. And then, of course, bringing the relevant expertise to the, to the cause of meeting the family's needs. So the facilitator, the, the youth partner, and wherever possible, whoever's important to this, to this young 
the person, bring them on to the team. So phase two, you are conducting your first child and family team meeting. Um, the team's going to review the family vision, develop a mission statement, really flying through this. Um, all this stuff's on the NWI website in a lot more detail, examples of all this stuff. Um, review and collectively prioritize the family's needs, and then brainstorm <coughs> different ways to meet those needs that match up with the family's strengths, okay? Um, and the different team members are taking on different tasks that have been agreed to. So just a couple of points about this phase. There's a whole bunch of, of others that people um, could, could, could describe in more detail. But you're really moving um, from reactive planning to proactive planning here and developing needs-based plans. Now, there very well may be behavior-based um, treatments or EBTs that are put into the plan. Um, but in terms of the overall wraparound planning process, we're really talking about not necessarily focusing on behavior, but focusing the process on priority needs to ensure that the overall planning effort is really based on engaging the families where they're at. Um, again, CBT and other kind of things that do focus on uh, behavior um, may be part of the plan. The other thing you're doing is you're, you're moving from, you, know, you hear a lot of people talk about we're strength space. Well, you're not just listing strengths. We're training folks to try to identify and leverage functional strengths. So, you know, instead of just David likes football, um, we're asking, you know, what's the context around that? Um, it's not just a descriptive strength. So, this is coming from my uh, my friend and colleague Marlene Madrid, who's a great wraparound trainer. So she describes it as, you know, the facilitator would ask about the context of of David and and and, and liking football, and and really getting into the details might uncover that. Well, actually, what David likes is to watch football with his grandfather, right, or his uncle, or whatever, um, on, on Sundays. Um, and so now the team has an understanding about the context in which this, this strength emerges. Um, and so next, the facilitator might explore what part of this situation makes David really feel strong about himself and motivates him to continually engage in this activity. And next thing you know, this team is kind of uncovering that um, a functional strength. So. David enjoys hanging out with his grandpa. He does well in social situations in which he feels like he can contribute to the conversations. Watching football is also an activity in which he doesn't feel anxious or worried. And so now you're beginning to get to this point where functional strengths can be tailored to address the specific needs and might actually become the basis for some of the strategies in the plan. In this case, it might be about finding other um, activities where he doesn't feel anxious or worried and that, that are, is causing him to get into fights and act out ways in which his grandfather can be involved more deeply. These are the kind of tough skills that we try to get oftentimes very young bachelor's level wraparound facilitators to do. It can be a very, very tough task, but this is the goal. Um, okay, so then uh, plan implementation. Based on those child and family team meetings, the team is, has a, a written plan of care. This is a little bit different than things like family group decision making Whereas, you know, this is an intensive process that takes place over time. Um, as I understand family group decision making and some other uh, of those models, those are kind of more about creating a plan and then kind of sending folks to kind of go forward, perhaps not with this kind of ongoing implementation support. Action steps are created, the team members are committed to do the work, the team comes together regularly. Um, when it meets, it really, we're, we're developing some um, online methods to try and encourage this. We find that people don't do it very consistently. But ideally, we're talking about um, a facilitation process where you're systematically tracking progress towards meeting the priority needs or achieving the goals that are in this plan. Um, and stopping and replacing action steps that aren't working. The orientation is not that people fail, but plans fail. Um, continue the action steps that are working. Celebrate success, um, et cetera. And then finally, transition. Uh, a lot of folks say, well, how long does wraparound last? How long is this process? Um, ideally, there's really not a, uh, a set point of discharge other than when the team no longer needs to meet regularly and this family can function without the formal wraparound process. Now, that having been said, you typically see these um, uh, wraparound initiatives try and get teams to transition between 6 and 12 months of effort. Okay? Sometimes, for some families, it might go longer. For some, it might be much shorter. But it's individualized to the families, meeting the families' needs and achieving their goals. Um, 
So a few points about what happens in, tra in the transition phase. And ultimately, um, kind of big picture point here is, is that transitioning in wraparound really takes place over the entire process, whereby you're trying to, um, <coughs> over time, reduce the reliance on the professionals and the covered or reimbursable formal services and more towards informal supports, kind of part of the goal. Now we recognize that at the point of transition, there may be several um, formal treatments that are still very necessary for these families. But the idea is, is that um, over time, you're reducing your relative reliance on the formal supports and more on the informal natural supports that the families might be able to um, rely upon over time. Um, so, What's the idea here? What does this all accomplish? Um, research and theory indicates kind of, and we can get into this, there's uh, stuff on the, on the website that gets into a lot more detail about the, that, the research that supports um, wraparound in, in, in a lot greater detail. But at, at a really high level, we're talking about two main pathways to outcomes here. Um, you're implementing the practice model. You're training folks to do that well. You're getting the system and the uh, workers really understanding the, the rationale behind the 10 principles of wraparound. Um, you have a high quality, high fidelity wraparound process and the two routes to outcomes are that we're getting the services and supports, um, which if this system is um, in an ideal situation, you have a service array that includes evidence-based treatments that are gonna be likely to effectively meet the needs of uh, these kids. Um, the services and supports are going to work better than just simply um, plugging them in or referring them or taking them off the shelf. So we have this more uh, engaging process that's really based on the family's prioritization of, of needs as well as the team. And that's going to make sure that there's greater engagement and that the services and supports work better individually and as a package. But in addition, the, the idea here is that this entire process actually builds um, family capacities um, in terms of um, greater social support, greater experience of success, which is leading to uh, greater self-efficacy, um, and, and so forth. And, and, and you know, so here you've got an integrated plan with fewer uh, priorities, fewer state, fewer goal statements, better engagement. And up here you have a process that really is, is supposed to be strength-based, um, build on success, create self-efficacy, create social support, and together um, the proposal goes. Um, family outcomes, even family outcomes will be, will be uh, better. And we're, typically with wraparound kids, outcomes are individualized to each family, but at a system level, you're usually talking about the big three, that these kids are at home, in school,